Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the show. I've got a great guest with me here this week, Morgan Zeggers. She's the founder of Young Americans Against Socialism and the Turning Point USA contributor. Morgan, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. I, I love your work, and I'm excited that we're connected. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, and I want to ask and just maybe give people a little bit of background about how you got started in all this, how you just tell us the origin story of Young Americans Against Socialism. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been a really great passion project for me. I am such a history nerd. And so uh, going back to just my basic origins, I'm from upstate New York, and I went to American University in Washington, D.C. for college. And so that meant it's 90% liberal. It's the number one most politically active campus in the country. And I was a little country bumpkin that had a dad who's a colonel in the military. He still is. He's in the reserves now. He served in Operation Iraqi Freedom, served on 9-11. My mom is like a big Fox News watcher. They're conservative, but they never push their politics onto me. I just was raised in a very uh, patriotic household and a household that appreciated history specifically. We were always watching the History Channel. And so I went from, I mean, like there is literally more cows than people in the county that my family lives in. And so I went to Washington, D.C. at this crazy politically active campus and there was a protest every freaking day and it was just this whole new world and so I had all of those classic stories of like crazy liberal professors and the things that they say there and all the stuff that's happening in DC but what really stuck with me is when I had a roommate that was a communist <laughs> and I, I say it now so casually wow. because I'm just so used to talking about it but I forget that it really shocks people when they hear me say it and for me i Day one, we're meeting each other, I'm introducing myself, and I'm getting distracted because I'm talking back and forth with her. And she's super sweet, super nice, and I was getting distracted by something I was seeing on her wall. It was a poster of Mao Zedong, Lenin, Stalin, Karl Marx, and Fidel Castro. And it said, welcome to the party, and they had these fruity cocktail umbrella drinks, these mass murderers and dictators are holding them, and they've got these like party hats on their head. And and I was like, what's that? <laughs> what do you say in that moment? And I mean, like, those are some scary guys. And I was like, what's that? And she looked at me and she said, oh, I'm a communist. And I spent the next semester with her hearing all about how her ideas were going to bring peace and prosperity and uplift the working class and progress and all the usual jargon that you hear from most people on the left and that you've heard from the last uh, 20th century from these same people. And it just never really turns out that way. When they promise progress, it usually brings regress and not just regress, but like the deaths of millions. And so it's kind of a big deal. And after college, I had gone into advertising. I ended up working at this firm in, in Boston. And I kid you not, Brad, my clients were like grass seed commercials and I did VH1 MTV. Uh, so I'm like scheduling cartel crew commercials. And I'm just so unhappy. I felt very unfulfilled. And at the same time as I'm doing this job where I'm work, I'm grinding. Like you are staying there until 730 at night in the office, walking back and half an hour into the city to your tiny little expensive apartment. And I just knew that this wasn't the life for me and that I needed to feel more fulfilled in the work that I'm doing. I needed to have positive impact instead of just trying to sway with ad campaigns, a certain number of people to watch cartel crew. <laughs> and so I, I started thinking like, okay, so you see these numbers on the rise of young people supporting socialism. I was thinking back to my communist roommate, all the good jargon that she was using, the positive feel-good words. And you're also seeing at that time, AOC was being elected. AOC's rising to power. The squad's coming to power. They are normalizing the term democratic socialism and using the same verbiage as my communist roommate. And I'm like, well, I guess I could do what I already do, which is create a certain content and then come up with my audience and then micro target that content to the audience that needs to see it. And instead I would micro target educational information about socialism and economics and history to the young minds across America. And the best way to do that is social media. Uh, and so we started by interviewing survivors from socialism and communism, making these really emotional uh, storytelling five minute videos that we would release on social media and try and micro target. And they ended up doing really well. And so we got that initial funding coming in from those. We got media attention and we've just grown now. It's been two years and we do much more than just interview survivors. We have a podcast now that we've launched with one hour discussions and we just do a bunch of different fun content, but it's at about a hundred thousand followers now on the Instagram page. And it just is really meaningful work to me. So I, I hope that we can keep doing it. And now we're even expanding into focusing more on how we can show people that they can live the lifestyle of freedom because a lot of people are looking for those immediate action items that they can take in their own life. 
Yeah, there's so much there that I appreciate and I can relate to. I mean, I don't know if you know this about me, but I went to the University of Massachusetts Amherst, oh, uh, which okay. has the sole distinction of I studied economics, as you might be able to tell by my shelf behind me with my soul and my freedmen, <laughs> uh, but uh, and my Hayek. But anyway, I studied economics at UMass. The economics department at UMass Amherst has the sole distinction of being the only openly avowed Marxist economics department in the United really? States. So uh, uh, many- Did you know this when you first went? No, I had no idea. It was just the most affordable public school, man, okay. when I'm applying to schools. I was trying to not get student debt. Uh, yeah. It was very interesting, though, because it was kind of similar to what you're describing with your communist roommate. Like, I was up against it. And I started out with not super firm political beliefs. Like, I just hadn't, I wasn't super political in high school, uh, like at all, really. <laughs> Uh, and then I all of a sudden I was up against this extreme far left social justice campus and then this really extreme Marxist ideology. Uh, and I was really repulsed by it and kind of propelled to the other side and to learn more about the other side. And I I think you and I are alike in this. A lot of people at UMass would just they just go with the flow. They would disagree, but they wouldn't speak out. Right. Whereas I was the shit stirrer. I was like, bring it on, like debate <laughs> me. Right. Like I'd be 40 verse one in the discussion section, but maybe tell us uh, what was it like at an American university or when you launched young Americans against socialism, going into these spaces and trying to take on these ideas. I know I've had my fair share of like horror stories, but what has it been like for you uh, in terms of the backlash and pushback? Yeah. I mean, I could, touch on a lot there. I, first, just to address it, I'm kind of like you. I wasn't political in high school. I just came from a very patriotic family. We had core conservative values, but my parents never pushed politics onto me. And in some ways, I wish that they would have. I wish that they were a little more intentional with that so that I didn't come to these ideas after. Because like, I, I'll admit, in high school, I used to have like pictures of Hillary Clinton on my wall, and I read The Feminine Mystique, and I, I used to wear these like opal jewel choker necklaces, and I was a little hippie listening to Fleetwood Mac all the time. And like, I really could have gone down a bad path there, Brad, but look at me now. I'm just killing the game being a future homesteading wife. <laughs> so I've really made the, the turnaround over the last like seven or six years. Now I'm 24. But when I went to college, I was just, first of all, why I started the organization is because when I was hearing those words from my roommate who had a poster of mass murderers and dictators on her wall, and she's telling me she's going to bring progress and uplift the working class, I knew that that was wrong, obviously. I mean, it, it doesn't take much to know that's wrong, but I had no idea what to say. And you would think, well, Miss Americana from upstate New York, middle of nowhere, would know what to say when she met a communist. And I truly had no idea. I, I, my mind went blank. And it was this a deep disappointment because I thought that I was capable of something like that. And I realized, you know, as this these terms get normalized, as we see the rise, I mean, this was back in 2013. 17, 2018, look at us now. I mean, like we have totalitarianism, authoritarianism, socialism, everything, every aspect of communism is on the rise. And we're going to continue to be confronted with these conversations with people on our campuses and our classrooms between us and our professors, us and family members, us and our friends, and especially with what the media is telling us. And I want everybody to be equipped with the basic information that they need to not only not be indoctrinated, but to also fight back in a, a respectful way, just have a conversation and stand up for our values and for American principles. And so I, I wanted everybody else to be equipped intellectual ammunition, if you will. Uh, so that happened on, on campus. Of course, not only did I have a commie roommate, but they did things, Brad, like try and get a segregated cafe on campus. I remember one time they like blocked the entrance and exit of the parking garage on campus because they wanted a, pe a person of color only cafe for them to have a safe space away from white people. That's and progress. they just acted... Yeah, they, they just acted like children in so many ways, like literally closed a parking garage down so that the people trying to leave to get home after a hard day's work or a hard day of classes, they couldn't leave. And then the people trying to leave their job and get into the parking garage to go to night classes because they were grinding, they couldn't do it. And it just was like, really, for segregation? So none of that really makes sense. I also had a professor that he said that the only reason people vote Republican is basically because we're all in the South and we are by the border. And that means there's a lot of immigrants and we don't like immigrants. And then the second reason was just race. 
that was those were the only two reasons why people in the South vote Republican or people in America vote Republican. And for me, it's like, okay, I'm paying how much? Fourteen hundred dollars per credit for this three credit class for this expert professor in political research to tell me a lie like that. When you break down the cost of each lie and the cost of us to pay to be indoctrinated with these false accusations against an entire half of the population, conservatives or just average Americans, I mean, what is the value of college? And so it, all of it was just a very frustrating experience for me. And um, to top it all off, what really stung the most, I would say, is that in the house of six girls that I was living in and on campus where we had you know similar friend groups, I was more ostracized for just being a basic and pretty quiet conservative Republican that, yes, voted for Donald Trump at the time, because this was like right after the election. So everybody's freaking out about him still. You remember that. Mm. I was more ostracized for that than she was for being a communist with mass murderers and dictators on her wall. And that's where we're at today. There's too much dangerous complacency, like you were saying, where it's just these people that, yeah, they know it's kind of wrong. They know that it sounds kind of dumb, but they're not speaking out. We live amongst many tyrants, right? I mean, we have people that believe in authority and force versus choice now. The problem is there are a ton of people that are not going to stand up. And that's what I felt on the campuses where you have a communist and a conservative and I'm more ostracized. So it, it I think what happens on college campuses happens in real life and in the real world and in, you know, careers and everything later down the road. These people graduate and they don't change their mind. Instead, they're bringing these crazy values and crazy experiences into the workplace and it becomes the America of the future. So I, I agree with you because I think that um, five or 10 years ago, people would talk about the campus craziness and there was a tendency among some smart people uh, that was mistaken to say, well, that's just college campuses. They've always been crazy, but people go out into the real world and they send, they, they wake up. Mm -hmm. it, what has really happened, maybe for some people that's happened, but more so the, the kind of craziness that's bubbled up on the campuses. Well, then the people graduate and they are bringing it to the media. They're bringing it to the big businesses, right? Like his big, big business is going woke and you have Amazon lobbying for a $15 minimum wage. All these companies are in bed with big government. They've really embraced a lot of elements of, of woke wokeness. So it's like they started on campus, but now they're really moving to many of the institutions in American life where educated people go and work. Uh, and so I just completely agree that we have to go and, and fight the ideas there. You know, we can't just look down on them or dismiss them. But I guess for me, it, a lot of it revolves around two figures with our generation, Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. When I think mm -hmm. of why our peers believe in democratic socialism, who they look to, right? Like people say, oh, Republicans love to talk about AOC. Well, that's true, but partly true because she is massively influential. Literally yeah. tens of millions of young Americans get their po political lead from her. her and she hides behind insane. that too. That's the good point. Is she'll, as soon as she says something crazy, we call her out for it like we would for any person on the political opposition side. And then she says, oh, they're just obsessed with me because I'm a young woman in politics and they're misogynist. And young so that's why, like, color. for me, I'm 24 and I'm like, I'll go at her then. Like, I'll call her out then. Whatever I need to do. Obviously, I'm not this, like, massive influential person. But it's like, okay, if you're going to call out any male in the GOP side that calls you out, then we got a bunch of women that'll do it. So it's it's just rid ridiculous to see the identity politics that she uses as a shield. Yeah, but I, I agree with you. But the main message that they push is essentially people are frustrated. Young people are frustrated with the status quo. And you and I could go into a million ways in which the problems of the status quo are not because of capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. But they're promised something different. Uh, they're promised democratic socialism. And you're a history buff, so I want to ask you about this. Um, but, but like AOC and Bernie Sanders they pitch to young people that that has been successful as, oh, well, we're not talking about the Soviet Union, right? We're talking about democratic socialism, the people voting and taking power and fixing society through justice and workers. A lot of this stuff starts democratic. I'm thinking of Venezuela in particular, where Chavez was elected um, and then became a dictator, obviously. But what's your response with your history background, right? In terms when people say, well, we don't support socialism, we support democratic socialism. Yeah, I mean, on. <laughs> 
It's so funny. Like we've gone so far down the road of like straight up communism at this point with everything with the authoritarianism of of COVID mandates and everything that's happened because of the pandemic that I'm like, oh, wow, back to this topic. I feel like I'm back in the mind of like February 2020 when I was at CPAC. I don't know if you go to CPAC, but uh, CPAC was the first time in 2020 where I spoke on the main stage there. And so I did media row and I just did interview after interview and everybody Every radio interview, they would ask me the same thing. They'd be like, oh, Morgan, it looks like Bernie Sanders is about to drop out of the primary for president in 2020. What are your thoughts on this? Have we defeated socialism? Are you going to close up shop? Do we even need a Young Americans Against Socialism anymore? <laughs> like, and I was just like, wait, why am I being asked this? This is part of the problem. It's way bigger than just one candidate for office. The Bernie Sanders, yes, he definitely helped normalize the term and he definitely brought it to the mainstream with him running in 2016. But oh my gosh, for people in the conservative movement to be thinking, oh, well, we defeated Bernie. We're all set. Close up shop for Young Americans Against Socialism. Not needed anymore. (laughs) I was like, wow, we got a lot of work to do. So that was like before COVID. There's actually footage of me on like OAN or something at CPAC. And they're like, Morgan, we're hearing more and more about this COVID thing. What are your thoughts? You are, you're surrounded by people there. Is there anything going on at CPAC? Is there any COVID there? And I remember all these people are walking behind me and I'm like, no, look around me. Everybody's hunky dory here. No thing, like nothing to worry about. No COVID here. And again, this is all before that whole thing kind of exploded, but it's just funny to look back at our mindset of everything uh, in the pre COVID stages. So when we talk about democratic socialism, yeah, it's just a farce. Like, I'm not going to play too much into the narrative and even try and break it down. At the end of the day, what they're doing is young people think socialism just means more taxes in exchange for more programs. I, My brother, for example, he was a Bernie Sanders guy, and he said, I'd rather pay more taxes in exchange for everybody having free health care. I just think that that makes more sense. And it's like, well, yeah, that would be kind of nice if we could make something like that work. It's just not going to be the case. When we talk about actual socialism, which is what these people want to implement, and you can hear what they promise and then hear what they actually want to do by just reading their websites, the Democratic Socialists of America, for example, they'll tell us time and time again that we aren't going to be like the USSR. It's not going to be like Venezuela. It's not going to be like the past. They said that throughout the 20th century, too, of, oh, it's the new next attempt at socialism, and this one's going to work this time. This one's going to be democratic. Fidel Castro even called himself a democratic humanitarian. So all that stuff is just BS. But the problem is when you do things like look at the DSA website, I remember this was maybe before COVID, they had an entire explanation on how in the long run, they do plan to end private corporations and they do plan to end private business. They just don't have a plan for it yet. And do you want to know what that means if they're willing to put on their website that they just don't have a plan for it yet? It means that they know what that plan is and they're not willing to admit it publicly because the left is very good at marketing and messaging and it would look really bad to say we're going to force people to give up their private businesses and their private economic independence. That isn't exactly a good slogan to put on the website. And so what the website says is, yes, we plan for this in the long term to eventually get rid of private business. But in the short term, our game plan is going to be to slowly raise taxes and regulation in order to slowly gain control of these private entities. And then we can take them over in the long run. All of this means that they just don't want to admit they're going to use force the way this happened throughout history. And uh, obviously what happened over the last two years really shows that these people do believe in force. And I just, they put it in their own words. And then as soon as we call them out for it, they try and take it off the website or they try and do a little switcheroo on us. But at the end of the day, these are the same socialists that we've seen throughout history. And it's not going to be different just because we are in America. We have to fight back in a, a very tenacious way. Yeah, this this reminds me of um, the ratchet effect, right? Basically, if Joe Biden, for example, just recently said once again in one of his speeches, I am a capitalist, right? I just want the government to help more people, but I'm a capitalist. And so it is true, right, that even if his whole spending agenda passed tomorrow, we would not have a fully government controlled state run economy, right? But it would take us whatever it is, 10% closer, right? In terms of GDP, the government spending is now like a third of GDP or something like that. It would become, um, it would become a half of GDP or whatever it would be, right? It would just take us closer and closer and it never comes back, 
really, very rarely. Just look at how Republicans failed to repeal Obamacare. It is yeah. very, thanks, John McCain. But Well, it's also, it's 10 times harder to take something from someone. Yes, so every exactly. time the left wins in policy, they are giving something to someone. So it's 10 times harder for us to win in policy because we're being like, okay, we're going to take that back now. We're, we're going to walk that one back. So it's, it's really hard to be a conservative in that sense. That doesn't mean, though, that I'm giving an excuse for why our Republicans and conservatives are failing us on Capitol Hill. I mean, we could rant about that one for a while, Brad. But uh, you bring up a good point. And that's why. So I do a lot of like campus speeches. I do a lot of speeches, especially, though, for older Americans that are concerned. They're so confused and they just want to understand why this is on the rise now. The numbers are crazy, right? So 70 percent, according to a 2019 YouGov poll, 70 percent of young Americans would vote for a socialist. And uh, 2019, another uh, Gallup poll shows like 58 percent want socialism over capitalism. The numbers look really scary. But what I try and tell everybody is it's really important to understand what you're up against. It's a rule in the art of war, right? By Sun Tzu to understand your enemy. And I'm not saying that every young person that wants socialism, socialism is uh, our enemy. Instead, we have to break down just our opponents and what we're up against, because I think the groups deserve different uh, communication tactics and approaches. And when you talk about socialism, it's the government seizing the means of production, nationalizing an industry. And so the government now runs that and provides that service, whatever it may be. It's bad because once the government is the only provider of that service or product, guess what they can do? They can say, unless you do X, Y, Z, we are not going to give this to you anymore. And that leads to well, a regime that can oppress its people and basically force them to do whatever they want. And that's what we saw in COVID, that idea of force of, okay, we will give you your freedoms. We will give you certain services. You will be allowed to do certain things if you comply. And so under socialism, when you have no economic freedom, when you rely on the government for basic services and goods, uh-oh, you are kind of at their whim. So that's socialism. I have little buckets of different audiences. I think we have a small group of radical leftists, and I call them the flat earthers of economics, because they've looked at the two dozen examples of socialism, actual economic socialism, where the government seizes the means of production. They've seen all of the different failures every single time it happens, and they still look at all of history and say, I think we could make this work if we just tried it one more time, a little bit different in America. And so flat earther of economics, those people are dangerous because if they actually got power, if they actually succeeded, they would lead to the deaths of millions. History is very clear about that. It's not funny. Now, that doesn't mean, though, that every young person that's like, yeah, AOC is kind of cool. Do I think that they are a flat earther of economics that needs to be ostracized and told, OK, then go live in Venezuela, then you ungrateful swine, the way that most conservatives talk to young people these days. So I'm always like, OK, before we say we're going to ship them off to Cuba, let's pause for the cause and say, what are their actual intentions? Are they falling for the lies of the far left because they care about the health care system that's crumbling? They care about the cost of college. They care about certain things like the environment and they see struggling in America and they want to fix it and they're falling for the lies of the left because they lack a basic understanding of economics and history and basic policy. Bingo, that's probably the case. And so for them, Americans have been on this foundation of classical liberalism and economic independence for centuries centuries. And I have a very strong feeling that most of these misguided young people that are being lied to, if they had the truth that they deserve, they would not be falling for the lies of the left. They would be our allies in this. And maybe we'll bicker it out as conservatives versus liberals, but at least we'll be on that foundation of classical liberalism and economic independence. And so that's really where I want to focus it on is these young people and really anybody in America that's falling for the lies right now, they could be our allies. They are potential allies. They are our fellow Americans. And there's a very small group out there that wants to divide us and that's not okay and exploit the useful idiots and so that understanding that but this is the thing though maybe you've noticed this too it's no longer just the leftists versus the naive liberals it is now like the elites so like the joe biden's of the world that are using corruption and government to just advance their own will and they will do literally whatever it takes there's the economic leftists and so the the flat earthers of economics and then there's the woke liberal, left, whatever it may be. And they are just as dangerous because they're very totalitarian in their ideas. And so I see 
all of these different little facets of the left as very dangerous and they're all helping each other in certain ways. They're all using each other for their own benefit and it's leading to this snowballing effect in America. At the end of the day though, I think if we get back to this platform, we're going to get as many people as possible onto our side and we're going to be able to prevail. But it's important to understand these different facets so we don't just look at the left and say they're all crazy. Sorry yeah, for the no, rant, but like, uh, no, oh, no, it gets no. me going. It, it's an important distinction, but, and look, I love your whole message, right? Young Americans Against Socialism, Classical Liberalism, Free Markets, um, and, and you did, but you did mention that you're a Republican, and, and that's cool. I'm, I'm an independent, but I'm lots of I, Republicans. I've always been a Republican, but oh my gosh, I'm disappointed, Brad. I should just say that. Well, that's where I'm going with this, it, because I feel, and I want to know your thoughts on this, that part of the reason that young people have been drawn leftward is Republicans have really failed to offer like consistent and principled, viable alternatives. Because, I mean, when you think of the Republican Party over the last two decades, you think of, ha of their officials having led us into failed wars, having wasted, uh, massively grown the federal government, having overseen almost as big budget deficits as the Democrats, uh, and then failing to do things like repeal Obamacare. There are some wins in there we could talk about. The tax cuts were great. Um, some deregulation, but it's like, do you look at the GOP or at least some of its main figures over the last, oh, over our lifetimes, right? And see that as part of the problem that they've really not lived up to the billing. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I identify as a Republican only in the sense of like, if somebody asked me my political party, I would say, yeah, I vote mostly, I, I vote for Republicans. Other than that, though, I usually say I'm a I'm a conservative, and that's because I have core values rooted in America's founding principles and our founding documents, in in individual freedom, self reliance, all of that really great stuff that's been abandoned. Like I'm also conservative, just in the sense that I can't wait to have babies one day. I can't wait to have a family. I don't know if you've heard me talk about it, but I have a, a hashtag normalized to radicalize, and I want to homestead and do all these really really great things. So that's why I'm a conservative. The GOP, though, are you kidding me? I grew I grew up, I was like a teenager still and a member of the GOP committee. I would door knock. I would do the petition signatures for every candidate every two years. I've donated. I've walked as many doors as I can and door knocked for as many candidates as I can. And for some reason, it's just how, how many times can you ask us to do it every two years before we start to get a little disheartened and realize like, wait, it's just this big conglomerate in Washington, D.C. that all these political consultants make so much money from every cycle and no real change happens for average Americans. Nobody at the top is telling us, OK, here are our visions for these different policy avenues over the next decade, for the next 20 years. I don't know who's at the top. That's what I've learned is like now that I've seen behind the curtains, I'm like, wait, everybody's just assuming that other people are going to do it and nobody's doing it. So wh where do we step up? Where do we step in? I had one situation, Brad, in like the movement. And I was I was told because I reached out to inquire about state level lobbying for a certain educational curriculum thing. First of all, I was told that education curriculum reform on history and economics was too cultural for them to take on. And they care more about economic stuff. And so they won't be dedicating their time. And then I was told that when I do this kind of stuff, I am disrupting the cogs and the wheels of the movement. And I all the cogs have their own places and I am disrupting the wheel by inserting my own little cog into it. I don't know. I got this whole talk down and I was like, okay, I wasn't asking you to do it. I was asking if somebody else was already doing it because I don't want to step on their toes. I would rather help somebody already starting it. But if not, then I'm going to do it <laughs> so that it's just like, I'm just trying to collab. Okay. I don't need to be told that I'm disrupting the cog in the wheel because the wheel ain't working, baby. So that was frustrating. That being said, though, I try and talk all the time. I mean, I have friends that are congressmen. I have friends that have like influential positions now. And I talk to them all the time of like, what is going on in these meetings? What is going on when you guys actually sit down and say, this is our focus for the next year, for the next five years and for the next 10 years to save this country? Is anybody talking about the cost of college and the fact that government's involvement is ruining it? Is anybody talking about how we can fix the healthcare system? Does anybody care about actually improving the lives of average Americans that are being infected by this every single day? Or is this just a joke to all of you? I'm sorry for yelling right now. I just, 
this stuff really gets me going because we're never going to win people over if we just keep competing with talking points. All the all the conservatives, all the GOP, they always talk about, oh, the left is really good at emotional messaging. The left promises really good things. They have really catchy slogans. We need to do stuff like that. We need to shake up our messaging. We need to add more emotion. I'm like, hello, maybe if you had actual positive change in people's lives, we could win people over for generations because we are having generational impacts on families, general generational impacts on individuals and on communities. Maybe that should be the focus instead of just saying, well, they have cooler slogans than us and they have AOC. So how can we be more young and hip and fun with our slogans? It's if you look and did a deep dive into all of it, it is a mess. And that's why I'm telling everybody out there that might think like, oh, our people in D.C. got it handled up. Oh, HQ's got it handled. I'm telling you right now, they don't got it handled. No one has a plan. And it's up to us to actually organize. And so when it comes to how I identify more and more, I'm identifying as a federalist. OK, I believe in local change, state power, getting away from the federal government. Part of the problem is that our states are so reliant financially on our federal government that is now basically a national government that ignores the Constitution. If we focus more on our states, we're going to be in a really great place. And that's my focus moving forward. Yeah, and it would also uh, take the temperature down if California got to be California and Texas got to be Texas, because when we're fighting over one federal government to either outlaw all abortion or um, allow all abortion or ban all guns or allow all guns, right? I mean, at some point, California and Texas are too different to live under the same rule. So I do really appreciate that idea of federalism. I think it's underlooked. I think it's overlooked rather by a lot of people. One thing I wonder though, is we're talking about a lot of these classical Republican principles or conservative principles that Republicans haven't always lived up to. Free markets, classical liberalism, the constitution, all these things that you say them and it's like preach, right? But there is a faction on the right that I find kind of concerning uh, that's more populisty in the sense of, not in the sense of wanting to like stand up for the little guy against big government, against big corporations. I'm all about that, but populisty in the sense of using big government themselves. There are Republican senators who are introducing things like uh, minimum wage increases. There are Republican senators who want the government to break up or highly regulate, or some people even want to nationalize big tech. Do you find that kind of section of the right um, completely opposed to your principles or are they just a different version of this? How, what do you make of all that? Because as someone, I personally really don't identify with that kind of conservatism. No, you touch on something interesting. So I should also preface like I came from my little mountain home in upstate New York. I live in the middle of nowhere now. I, I moved to Texas and I travel a lot and I I technically go to things like CPAC and yes, I have a group that has a political name. I'm actually trying to get away from like the movement group reputation though. And that's because I just, I, I'm just not a part of it. And so, yes, I do talk about these values, but like I am an outsider very much. And I love that fact when I, look at it from the outside. And then when I also see it from the inside in terms of like table conversations and, and, you know, cocktail hours where everybody's getting a little tipsy and people start talking, I'm able to see the different factions of the movement. And it is fascinating to see the rise and the contrast between the conservatives like you and then the conservatives that are the, you know, America first. And they're the ones that believe in using government to their own advantage in the sense that that's how they think that they can help people. And so I don't want to, obviously there's like, the gripers and stuff, they hate me. Um, they're separate. I'm talking more about like the, the people that use the term America first in a well-intentioned way. Yeah. Um, those two groups, it's important for them to not divide. Okay. Now's not the time for us to like hate each other and to think the other side is evil. We have a, a bigger problem at hand. We just have different views on how to go about fixing these problems. And so understanding that each group has an, well, good intentions is very important. That being said, I think a very dangerous mentality, and you might probably agree with me on this, a very dangerous mentality throughout history has been a person who believes who's in power right now is bad, and it's bad that they're getting more power, but if I was in charge and I had that power, things would be better, and I would be able to fix it. And things would be better in, in general if our side had that power. We would use it correctly. And I kid you not, I've been in conversations with people in our movement who say that. 
of they are against certain behaviors when the left does it, certain powers when the left does it, but they're fine with it as long as they're the ones in charge. Whether that's like, I've heard it from term limits. I don't, I don't know if you feel this way. I'm about to go off on some. Immoral behavior really turns me off. Whether that's like a guy who inappropriately messages me and he has a girlfriend and he thinks that if he sends something wholesome to me, then I'm going to be attracted to him and want to date him instead. Stuff like that. I'm immediately like, please leave me alone. Same thing with politics. If you are one way public and one way private, I'm just not interested in hearing what you have to say and I'm not interested in working with you. So I have a very high standard now because it's important to understand who you're working with and who you're giving power to and more attention to and we all have to keep an eye out for that. But when you're having a private conversation with someone and they say, oh yeah, I'm going to introduce legislation for term limits when I'm in Congress because I think we need term limits because people are in power too long and, and they don't do anything when they're in power. And then I say, oh, okay, so are you going to put those term limits on yourself as well? Well, no, no, because I have important work and I've got to get it all done. But like, I'm different. <laughs> <laughs> what? And so it's like, you're kind of uh, exposing yourself here, buddy. That's how everybody believes. It's like, oh yeah, everybody else is the problem. But if I had the power and if I had a little more time than everybody else in power, then I would be fine. I'm not going to self term limit myself. It's just that kind of stuff where I'm like, really? But in general, when I see these people, I see that they have good intentions. I just would warn them that the power you give yourself when you are in power could potentially be the power that the your opponent has once they follow you. Because we live in a republic where you can pick leaders. And I'm sorry, we went from Bush to Obama to Trump to Biden. It's clear that we do some flip-flops as a nation. And so we have to keep that in mind. I would say, though, to kind of like, piggyback off of what you were saying with like the loss of values and like, what are we even doing in directionally in a movement? When I was coming of age and learning about policy, I came into the, the space of politics thinking like, oh, we've always had the national debt. This has always been a problem. Like it's just unfixable. And, and this has been a thing for decades. It's just something that, uh-uh. Brad, this is a fairly new concept. Our Republican leaders completely abandoned fiscal responsibility and an being responsible with our taxpayer dollars in very recent times. This is a new issue. And so for our generation, we're coming into it as like, yeah, our government is out of control. Our debt is in the trillions, but that's just the normal thing. That's how our government operates. No, it is not. That kind of mentality of that being normalized History. is very dangerous for our movement. Have you ever thought about that? Yeah, it is a very good point. Um, it wasn't too long ago. They balanced the the budget, right? Like what, 20 years ago? Uh, yeah, and, and people think that's things. long ago, but that was recent, recent. Right. Well, Morgan, I really appreciate your time. Uh, before I let you go, the most important part of the podcast that people listen to for every week, they, they like to, they don't, <laughs> eh, they deal with the blabbering, right? But they want to know your most controversial food opinion. Okay, I don't know if this would be controversial. Some people think it's just weird and kind of sad, but I eat food for nutrients. And so every day I eat baby carrots, grapes, and then for lunch, I eat a hamburger patty with Montreal steak seasoning on it and cheese. And when people hear that, they get really weirded out. And they're like, that's it. Very that sounds kind of depressing. And I'm I like, eat, hey, it's all the nutrients that I need. I eat grapes and baby carrots and a turkey sandwich every day for lunch. Thank like you. Clockwork. Okay. No. It, it, it works. Okay. It's what I need. It gives me the substances to get going in the day and have the energy that I need. And that is all I need. There we go. Morgan, thanks so much for coming on. <laughs> thanks for having me, Brad. 